in a little while, we will, um, who I have spent a great deal of time rummaging to find information about because the first half of the 20th century couldn't give him the time of day. So um, we'll see a big change. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to start with something you had not seen in any of the classes here, another painting by Thomas Cole, because I was really um, energized last time thinking back over people's reaction at the end of the class, like, oh, I like Cole, or no, I like, um, I like Durand better, that I was so uh, interested to find that there were strong reactions for one and not for the other, either way, that there's a, a taste um, that is appeal, one finds appealing in the other. So it's not like they're just looking at them as, the generic landscapes, and that's just super great. Uh, <clears throat> so I wanted to bring in one more, Thomas Cole, this one, and then one you saw last time from Asher Durand. I think the differences between their works are partly the difference in their personalities, and some does reflect the change in American culture just within the space of a decade decade and a half, two decades during the 20th century. So this one by Cole, it's um, now, now someone has actually recently thought maybe this is not what it is, but this is what it has gone for is a long time. A view of the mountain pass called the Notch of the White Mountains. It's 1839 and it's about five feet across. Five. And uh, as um, while I remember to say this, I will, although this will come up later. The general sense is that for a person to see the full width of a canvas, you need to stand about two and a half times its width back. So that lets you know that sometimes you're in, you're not getting to see the full painting or is taking for granted you're going to see it in a large space where you can stand back and really admire it. So this is a big painting. Uh, and there has been thought to be there's a story behind this painting, a kind of story that is the ones that appeals to Cole, which is about nature's beauty and potential for disaster. Uh, the really romantic view, romance, meaning that whole, anything that sense of awesome, overwhelming, uh, something that just fills you with awe. <clears throat> what there is in here, uh, there's a building in the background, if this is the site correctly identified, that's an inn. Um, way far away, there's a carriage disappearing into the trees. There's a woman and a child walking down a path toward this man on horseback. And then you have this clearing with a characteristic, I know, this is like, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, this is why I'm having to tell you. And if you have a not good enough quality reproduction, which this might not be, it's extreme. I'm on my screen doing 200 magnification, 300 magnification to sometimes see these things. Um, there's a characteristic blasted tree trunk, the, as good as a coal signature, although he always did sign his works. And then you have this clearing with also cleared trees. But then you see, like that early one I did of that that dead pond is it's flanked by all these trees that have died. So you have the sense there's been some disaster here. And the narrative is that there was at this place at the Great Notch with these really precipitous hills, especially the one you just see, the, the gray granite side of it, um, there was an avalanche. And there was a family, three kids, parents and two servants who got out in time. 
But where they went that night, there was then subsequently an avalanche that, that I think there was one person who got out. And two of the children, they never did find. So it's the kind of tragedy that you know gets a great deal of appeal in the news. And that's the story that Cole is presenting, right? The beautiful fall landscape. He always goes for those fall colors. The strong contrast, just the glory of that, this wonderful clouds, the clear day, companionship, people coming, commerce, and always, despite this happy human and natural life, it can change in an instant. So that's so often the kind of story that he's drawn to. Whereas Durand, and this is about not much more than 10 years later, this uh, view in, in, in Dutchess County, New York, um, people said about Durand landscapes, oh, you, you can always tell where he, he's done them because it seems so realistic. But this is so bucolic. I mean, this is just looking across a peaceful valley uh, where there's, there's some animals grazing, there are farm fields, and the woman is standing up to enjoy it more. Essentially, she's a stand-in for us. You know, that we're, we're like her, looking out at that landscape, enjoying the feel of the breeze, that sun, and all the wonderful American landscape that they have created out of the wilds. So that's also a shift away. There's nothing about the sublime, the terrible, the horrifying here. Uh, and that's also typical of Duran's work, that, he, that he, he's not drawn to that, but n nor was that as big a thing in the culture anymore. So, um, and the cooler colors, the sort of more limited palette, not so dark light, that also makes it more temperate. So there's, a, a nut, in a nutshell, a difference between the two men. Of course, you can always, just as I was taught, if you want to make a point, never illustrate it. And the other was, you can always choose your illustrations to make whatever point you want to make. So that might be at work here. So today, I want to work at the, look at the work of Frederick Church. A Good Long Life. There he is in his adulthood. And this is a very early, he was 20 when he did this. This is a man with naturally precocious artistic skills. Um, he came from Hartford, as you saw there. His family went back generations. They were sort of founders of, of that area in Connecticut. And he came from a family that was quite wealthy. So he had wonderful advantages. And he had this desire to become an artist. Well, one of the family friends was that Daniel Wadsworth, who bought the Catterskill Falls from Cole, who founded the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Uh, and Daniel Wadsworth arranged to have Frederick Church be Cole's pupil for two years. Only pupil Cole ever took. So the first one, you'll just look at this painting. Today, I have to look at my notes a great deal more than I did before. This is called Hooker and Company Journeying Through the Wilderness from Plymouth to Hartford in 1626. And so you can see why I don't remember all of that. Um, but it's also five feet across. This is a 20 year old. How does he afford to make a painting that's that large? It's because he has family resources. And he has courage. And he has what? Some familiarity with the tradition of landscape painting. Because what do you see there that goes back to the 17th century? Large tree one side, small tree the other side, strip of landscape across the base, water leading you into the distance and reflecting the sky. 
first year, Claude Lorraine. So he's familiar with the tradition and just because I think it's somewhat, well, it's just interesting. This is one of the first ones I showed you by the thought to be the first American landscaped artist, a man named Winthrop Chandler in the late 18th century in the 1770s. Do you see how, the great similarity too? The trees, the figures processing, not in depth, but just across the front of the picture. The composition is very similar. A man named Winthrop Chandler. Uh, and uh, you need to be interested, I think, in antiques to come across his name. So here's this young man's painting of a scene from his family history. There's also like a, for a, a culture at that time so steeped in Christianity, there's echoes of like the entry into Jerusalem you know, because the family history leaving the colony where they were and establishing a new one in Connecticut. So it's, it's aligning American history and biblical history. Um, so we, ha we have these different layers of ambition and connection. So for two years, 46 to 48, he, he works with Cole. Asher Durand had been uh, slightly older than Cole. So their relationship was that Cole sort of taught Durand but was as a collegial relationship more than anything else, rather than really instructive. But you see how much here church is paying homage to his teacher because there we go back again to the Oxbow. And this, now I ask you out of curiosity, not to torment, torment you. Um, what's the difference? Yes. I was just thinking that this is the weather event that causes trees to walk all over like that and it's happening. Okay, so, so, yeah, and you can see the stormy sky here. The other doesn't have a stormy sky right around it. You see anything else? Just in the overall like um, presentation or the, the look of the picture? Yeah. Oh. Now, of course, that's a detail. And this, in the original painting, this is a would be a, a physically smaller element than this other, which is a complete painting, The Storm in the Mountain. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, to me, there's something about the way that's lit that's extremely different. With uh, lighting coming along the underside of the broken branch and really penetrating down into there where it fell apart, as if it were sort of a almost artificially lit compared to that. It can be the position of the sun. Yes, it could. But of course, it's the artist who's deciding where he puts the sun and where he puts it. So it's, it's his decision. It's sort of the other reason of the screen, the vibe is going down behind it, like this is the edge of the cliff. this one? It kind of almost looks like a structure, like a, a temple in a, in a painting from another century. I mean, it's got architecture. It looks like, to me, it looks architecture. Okay. And then, of course, I'm having looked at a great many churches recently, um, can tell you there's something else about this. This is much more detailed. Each little leaf with its light on it, each bit of the bark compared to that. 
And that's one of the most uh, salient characteristics in Church's work is just extraordinary realistic detail. And that's frankly one reason why he was so out of favor in the end of the 19th and most of the 20th century, because that's not something that modernist art goes for, just imitating nature. I mean, no. Yeah, we have to talk with David. Right. So I think if you were just to give this a cursory glance, you might say, oh, this is a photograph. Well, it's not. It's his painting, The West Rock, in um, just outside um, New Haven. And just let me give you the size of this one. Yeah, it's also, now this is about three feet across. So he's working on quite a small scale to get that d degree of detail. And it's in um, the Museum of American Art in New Britain, Connecticut. So quite accessible. It was also a scene of early American history, and he, he did a kind of like a series of American history. But, but this is the, the full thing. So um, you can see they're raking up the hay. There's a wonderful clearing sky, and all those clouds so marvelously uh, mirrored in that stream. That's the photograph. You see how faithful he is to it? So that's a great magnification, magnification of a painting that's not much more than four feet across, three feet across. The bushes you see mirrored in the water. You also see almost the leaves of the bushes mirrored in the water. As opposed to coals, where always you can see it's a painting. You see strokes of paint that are leaves, instead of leaves that, by George, it's a, it's a stroke of paint, not a leaf. And this is neither of man, but um, this interest in this kind of extraordinary precision is something that was um, across Europe also in the middle of the century. Um, there was uh, one particularly uh, influential writer about art, uh, John Ruskin, who practiced art somewhat, but he, he wrote a book on the modern, modern artists, five volume book, and it was largely uh, glorifying Turner, but he 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 had precepts for artists. He said, never neglect, never select. Show everything absolutely the way it is. That is the standard for the highest quality art. That it is just as precise as possible. So this is an example of a an English artist named Holman Hunt who did that, and that's not the it's the details a little bit better than that. But you can get the sense when you're looking at the flowers down here in the bottom foreground, how each flower, each thorn by the uh, brambles is, is present. And um, then the light on this is also very realistic late afternoon light. Now, all this realism is not something that denies that a painting can have another meaning. Because here, this is called also straying sheep. And that's a reference to the Christian like people straying from the Good Shepherd. And this is also right on the cliff, um, not too far from the Dover Cliffs. This was done right after the revolutions of 1848 when England was concerned that the French would invade and they were worried about having open borders on the channel. So there's a political connection and a Christian connection and also that detail. You can see it there. You could just plunge your hand in the wool on the back of those sheep. This is a Norwegian artist. I mean, 
it was it was across Europe. There are a number of American um, artists who studied at a art school university, actually, in, in Dusseldorf, where it was very famous for teaching that. A number of Hudson River schools went there. So, so they're, they're trained in this technique or to value it. Then I had one other comparison I wanted to do between a coal and a church. This, well, again, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, so this is coal. It's just a um, uh, view of the Catskill River. In the middle ground, in the water, there's one person standing by a rowboat just at the left. That's the only figure in there. Slightly closer view. And here's one by church. It's just called it New England Scenery. Well, he's paying, uh, it's, he, he's responding partly to his teacher because again, you have water, someone in the boat, right in the middle of the ground, mountains across the background. Now this could be absolutely true to the scene, but you can look at this as just a painting. And uh, so you, you go back to those um, Catskill Mountains, I think those are, and that's the stop. Then you're up in the sky. And it's like, um, almost like a stage set, that's the backdrop. And then from there you go up. You don't have the sense that the world goes on somehow further than what you can see there. And look at that. It's an infinitely extending world. So that's a different conception. It's almost like not thinking of it as a painting, but it's another way of looking at, making it look more real, more like life. And of course, it's a great sky. And clouds, clouds matter. This is Constable, Constable's Clouds. That's the white horse that's in the Frick from 1819. Um, you remember, uh, you probably don't remember, but Cole and, and Constable were good friends. And here's one of Constable's sky studies. When he looked, early in his life, he was doing them for sort of the meteorology. And then toward the end, he starts thinking, oh, they have dramatic potential too. And I'll use them for the drama. This is one by Cole. Because it is looking at the sky and looking at the sky. And all of this is partly scientific. And then part of this is uh, the second half of the 19th century is the time of transcendental thinking. The, not so much a specific deity, but the, the great cosmic something to which we can connect, represented in the skies, and what is going to bring your eye to the skies the way the clouds do. So now I think we're almost totally on to work by church. This is one he did in memory of Cole. Um, and it's just called In Memory of Cole after um, Thomas Cole died. So represented by that little memorial and the piling clouds. There's another source for all this. Uh, people were studying um, Alexander von Humboldt, a great German scientist. And he was saying, this is the age when there's going to like break down the borders between art and science that the one person is going to be able to do both because they're both magnifying the glories of the universe. Is that, is that memorial actually exist? Or is I think that's, no, I think that's just. And then I just have several paintings of churches, skies. He's famous for skies and waterfalls in particular. 
This is a view over the Hudson River at early morning. It's small. He did this sort of as a sketch for himself. Just a little bit picking up the glint of the water there. And the sun hitting the underside of some clouds with great light and not reaching the ones that are closer to us yet. There is a person a little bit to the left of center at the base. So again, there's somebody there as our stand-in looking at the scene. And that was Coles. But this is infinitely more dramatic in the terms of nature, isn't it? But it's easily accessible drama. I mean, you don't have to look at it very long and say, oh, yeah, I got that. <laughs> and this one is this above the, above the clouds at sunrise. Because these images are taken from Google, and Google largely <laughs> takes them from books, you can never be absolutely certain that you're getting correct color, which is a real problem in an artist where color matters so much. But it does seem that this, it, this is not a super intensified pink, that he, he did show very pinkish clouds. And uh, this is done so close to that one, with that, to the memory of Cole. Hear that bird flying away. That's probably an allusion to coal. Yes. And you'll notice the way that branches of the tree bend toward and they also, they've been in unison with the cloud. This is a not, well, see, I'm thinking that probably is closer to the real color, but I'm not sure. I'm just, that's my gut sense of it. And a bad reproduction, but close enough. So, so it picks up the one side of the tree branches and trunk with a light. Then a number of them he does. This is something I, I don't know how to get the information. I want this information. I don't know if he's using um, new pigments that are being produced, um, chemical pigments. I don't believe so. I think he's still using old fashioned earth pigments for these. Although, um, Others are now available. And he's still in all of these, even when they're small sketches, um, he, he, he might do an outdoor sketch, but then he goes back to his studio. These are all studio paintings. This one has a rather poetic title. Hmm. Twilight, short arbiter, twixt day and night. You see one building with lighted. And just the faintest light in the stream that meanders back at the lower right. Just a few trees breaking up the horizon, the incident, a little incident on the horizon. Skudik Peninsula from Mount Desert. He, late 40s and 50s, he, he went up Maine, New Hampshire. He traveled around, fought, not just staying in the confines of the Hudson River territory, but these clouds lit from, lit from before. It made me think about how much now the fact that we have electric light and so much urbanization, we're probably not so aware of all the permutations in the clouds <clears throat> that we would have been if we lived more outdoors and in a 
where there's less light coming from the ground. Sunset Bar Harbor. There's great sweeping clouds. And this is just a rough sketch he did. Um, he, by this time, he had built Olana, which I'll show you some oh, later on. But he, he presumably went outside and just did, did sketches like this. This is in the 1870s. And that's one quick, actually, where it says, um, stop sharing. Under there, it says Olana. He's just scratched it in here. These are on paper, and then they've been applied to um, a canvas. And many of those you can see if you go to his place at, at, at Olana. There's still some of the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York has some as well. However, when you look at the top of those cumulus clouds, do you see that they too are still more detailed? Yeah, that's just that's just his imprint, his style. And then, oh my goodness, we are going to be way, through way so way too early today. Blame it on blame it on church because <laughs> couldn't find enough. Um. Well, I could not find much about who he had as patrons, other than that he, he, he sold very well. There's no problem there. But then in the mid-50s and 60s, he started doing what were called grand paintings. And this is the photograph of Niagara Falls. But one of his first grand paintings in 1857 is Niagara. So here you have the American Falls left and the horseshoe falls the Canadian side over there. And since the 1700s, people had from Europe had been going to Niagara Falls. It was even people from Europe were saying there's no natural phenomenon as awe inspiring in Europe as that. And these are um, little engravings, well, tinted engravings by an Englishman from the very beginning of the 19th century. For them, he just sent a, little, a portfolio you could buy of views of Niagara Falls. So it was, um, one of the things that made this country famous. And Thomas Cole had done a painting of it in 1830. Niagara Falls from a distance. By this time, since this was such a popular site, there were hotels, there were outlooks, there were little factories. And what do we have here? Two Indians. He would have called them Indians. This was all Iroquois territory. And they are made smaller than life. So here's that manifest destiny message yet again, that this is the past, but he's not bringing himself to show it as it is in the present. That's 1840, uh, early daguerreotype. That's, that is the falls. So this is what we're working up to. So this is Church's great painting of, of this. It's uh, seven feet across, this painting. It's in the Washington National Gallery. But I'm going to take this in steps. See, so he, he made a number of trips there, 57, 58. 
he went in the winter when it was freezing cold and he couldn't do much. Then he came back and he did pencil sketches and he did oil sketches and he did it from Canadian side and he did it from the American side and he did it from the down below and he did it from up above. He was just coming to grips with this, exploring all these ways as, as he's working toward, well, it's the creative process. He doesn't know what he's trying to get at, but he's working towards something. And this is one of the very early ones he did, which is, um, it's one of the views that, that uh, the print had shown. It was kind of a traditional, other painters had done it too, a view from down below. So, so you can see the majesty. You, I didn't bring back in the painting by Turner of the Falls at, at Schaffhausen, which show people down below and the water crashing down on you. So here, this is one where he did a, a sketch. I think this is a, about a foot and a half across. And there was this tower, it was called a tortoise. That tower was built in the, around 1830. It's just the faintest sense of the beginning of a um, rainbow in the spume at the far right going up there. Now, when people saw this, this was criticized. I mean, other works he had done were criticized on the same grounds, which is that he was not good at falling water, that that didn't really look like water. It was like a sort of a just flecks of white. And what he was doing was actually what he had been taught by Cole when he had done this one, the Catterskill Falls, with standing underneath and the water coming down. So you just have this almost like V-shapes of white. Because how in paint are you going to flex, fix something that you want to show is moving? I couldn't get the full image, so you have to have only a part of one he then did. He's mastered it. This is a view at the bottom, and forget where it says Alamy. That, that does mean that this is very good color. But there, when you look at that water, that's closer to the way your eye captures. We don't see little Vs of white. We get, you can see a patch where it's one, then you see a patch in another. This is done later than his great painting, but it was so much in demand that uh, he made this for a man in Scotland who wanted to, says, now you go to Scotland to see this particular painting. It's a fairly large painting too. But from that view, and there are people in the Scottish gallery looking at it, so you get the idea of the size. So he's working also more ambitious images. So there he's showing the American side. He, he does watercolor some either side. And this is quite well finished. You get the idea he's working toward a final idea of what he wants as a painting. Still giving you some rocks there so you've got a foreground to keep you in place. And that's a close-up of it. When you see in the water, see how deft he is doing these, you know, he just knows. For the white cap, I just need to do one, one flick of the brush and I've got it. Then this is quite a finished drawing. And it's extremely detailed. Uh, let's get the idea of the size of the drawing. Mm. Oh, no, it's only a foot and a half across. Yeah, a foot and a half. Yes.
but he's made the great leap. Maggie, can you hear me? And that's the, the painting itself. This is so different from all of those drawings. Where are you standing? You're in the water almost. There's no foreground. There's nothing at the sides. There's none of the formula. There are no rocks that you can look at. You are completely in the falls. And as this is at seven feet, you would have to stand so far back to see that. You would generally be seeing it so that the painting is almost around you. Uh, one critic said, all that's missing from the falls is the roar, because they just saw this is just so overwhelmingly, overpoweringly real. And to go from thinking of all those conventional ways, this is this is a real to my mind, I like a this is real the, the genius of, of the leap that he thought, ah, now I'm gonna make a painting where you're in it, you're not looking at it. It's not framed, it's not composed, you don't see how to get into the distance, you are just living in it. And that's rain on the left side, right? Yes, that's a spray from the falls. So this was much admired for the accuracy. Actually, uh, I had to read this to think about, to realize that no, we are being gulled when we look at this. Because that foreground water, actually, the river has been tipped down. You see? At the back, you're looking at something. So that's our eye level. And then it's as if the ground must slope down toward us. So we can see more. Do you, do you perceive that? Because I think I didn't see it until I had to, you know, I read it and then I looked. At, oh yeah, look at that. It's just the whole tilt of the land has been moved a little bit like this. And likewise, of course, the artist is not, not only is he not there, he's painting this on the 10th street in, in Manhattan when he does this, but he never took a sketch from that, that point of view. And then there would be meanings that people understood or they read in this. Um, they gave it an Old Testament meaning. This river, crossing this river, is like crossing the Red Sea. Americans, when they crossed into this country and were going into new land, it was like Moses leading the Jews out of Egypt into a new land. This is America's destiny. And the rainbow, that's the uh, rainbow that God um, when he first destroyed humankind, installed in the sky to remind himself that he was never going to destroy people again. And then there was one, I have to think of it, there's some other, biblical connection to it, so another Old Testament, but I'll have, I'll have to think for a moment what that is. But so people read that in this readily. And then what I'm amused by is this one little bit of flotsam, jetsam down there. What is that? Now, I'm sure he did not really mean this, but that's Cole's blasted tree, isn't it? <laughs> Out. <laughs> Your era is over. <laughs> Those kind of landscapes are no longer in fashion. <laughs> I do want to. 
oh, the river, okay, the river was the flood, the rainbow was the covenant, yes, and the column of mist was the pillar of cloud that guided the Israelites. So it's all about being led into the new land. I think it's someone else who read it, but it was be, in this time, still assumed that almost every natural phenomenon had another layer of meaning. It was not simply a natural phenomenon. Because otherwise clouds would have been just clouds rather than the presence of God's providence. Uh, here's what someone else said about this, an author writing at the time. It's a testament to the national spirit defined by the broad continent we call our own, by the onward march of civilization, by the conquering of savage areas. So it's, all of this is so, this, of course it's called, right? Um, visions of the American landscape, visions of landscape, because this is onto the land, we, we impart all these meanings and these were the meaning, that meaning at the time. Well, let me tell you how this was uh, shown uh, originally. He had a pavilion built, and this was the only painting in there. There was a room with just very dim lighting, lighting only of the painting. Uh, viewers had to pay 25 cents to go in. And then if they went in, they had an opportunity to buy a print of it, uh, a good print and then a less expensive print uh, for two different prices. And there was something like 100,000 people went through to see this. He was one of the richest artists, <laughs> definitely, of the century. That I, can't, I know it was in New York City, but I don't know exactly where the location was. Did, did church believe, did he say that he put that into the painting or that he agreed with anybody that read that into it? Okay, so let me get, now you went down in the down and dirty. <laughs> Turn this off. <laughs> no. Sure. There's still not much, there's, I'm sure there's an enormous amount of information available, not accessed by me because we don't have enough books here that for me to easily get at. And I think there's a lot of scholarship yet to be done because he was well into the middle of the century, looked down on so disparagingly as just a literal huckster, as a, um, He was he's antithetical to the sense of the individual searching, self-expressive point of view. So he's a commercial artist. And what could be worse than to be a commercial artist? So that's what I say. It was, in a sense, then like going to a panorama. Because you'd have this around you. You couldn't see it all at once. And there it isn't with only one single light source like the panoramas were from the beginning of the 19th century. So here are the details. I just have two details, I believe. Wonderfully accurate, wonderful, wonderful. Isn't that water cold? And couldn't you put your knee, you walk right into that and feel the force of that driving you along? Um, he then had this, um, he sent it to Boston. It was shown here. Then I think it was shown in Philadelphia. He was uh, intending to send it to Paris to be in the internet, the Universal Exhibition in 1867. This is a Monet, which actually shows the fairgrounds there. And this is a Monet that was in the show, which one you can go see in the Met. So that's French art at this time. 
Now there was, there is also very, this hyperreal French art as well, but when hyperrealism was, has been out of fashion, we don't get to look at it. It's, it, it's not fashionable for us. And then to just at the end here, I'll show you one other. He, I tried to be true to what I said, that it's only going to be Visions of America, which lives out some of his great paintings. He did one of icebergs. He did one of several of erupting volcanoes in Mexico. And this one is just called In the Heart of the Andes, did in 1859. He made two trips down there. Uh, this, uh, this is in the mess. So okay. you can actually go see it, but the size, this is 10 feet across. No, these, these are, he's, he, he took enormous numbers of sketches and then he assembled them into appropriately evocative, dramatic paintings when he came back. And there are quite a few paintings he did that are set in South America or so this one, it was in a darkened room lit by gas jets behind silver reflectors. Admission was 25 cents and 12 to 13,000 people visited it monthly. Now here he's also done something very interesting with the view because where are we? Again, there's no place for us. We're up above and the paintings were shown in a room fairly low so it is as if we were spectators looking down on the scene it looks like the hudson valley with the alps on well he has to do those waterfalls doesn't he yes and This is why he wants for a show at the Met, the way it was shown, because this is typical. They are theater. You're going to a theatrical event. You're going into that darkened room with lighting like it would be gas lights at the base of a stage. It's a precursor to a movie. And this is actually the building where he was working. Well. I don't think Cole worked there, but um, Durand worked there too. This was destroyed in the 30s down on West 10th Street. This building was made just for artist studios. And here's a colleague of that time. This is what the studios were like inside. So this was the world of artists who really made money. And that's all the images I have for today. Next time, I want to show you another artist who made money on the same grand scale. That's Albert Bierstadt. Uh, he takes that out to the West Coast doing this. And it is all in the area that we, we call Greenwich Village now. OK. I cheated you out of five minutes here. Does anybody have anything you want to ask? Barbara? I don't know. Certainly the first one I've come across that really treats his own work as if he's the impresario rather than the creator. By the, I think the last, he, and he didn't die till 1900, as that French avant-garde started to come to this country, his, his reputation really plummeted, but uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So do you like him? Church. Oh. Well, yeah, yeah, well, right. No, because no, it's, 
<laughs> if you're really steeped in the importance of the artist revealing the artist's own character and the process of making something, uh, the sort of the self-exploratory quality of a, an art, you'd be completely frustrated with him because there's none of that. That's true. Yeah. So it really, it was at the time when um, hyper-realist paintings came in again, that people started to look back at his works. Oh, oh. But the thing is that this also had a meaning for people at the time. It wasn't just the technical virtuosity, but they were reading into this, the manifest destiny, this is the nature of America. This, he did one painting, the most extraordinary thing I could not bring in, couldn't bring myself to bring in. At the time of the Civil War, he did one with the sky, where the clouds make the ribbons of the red stripes on the flag. Maybe now that I've mentioned it, I will bring it in next time. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you couldn't consider that some of these landscapes were about, you know, he's steady. What? No, no such thing. I mean, you could like attribute some of it to his own inner, you know, evolution and vision of human. I mean, without like. You see, that's it. I think if I were able to find something, some some writer about him who writes persuasively about that, I would be persuaded. But it, that hasn't reached it. Now I need help. I got it up to here now. What, what do we have to do to get it? Uh, you can exit. Oh, you want you want to take uh, this? Yeah, out, I'm right? going to take that okay, out, and I'm going to go down.